This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome everyone to the Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell. The Exxon is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. And then other affiliates carry the show until 6 a.m. Eastern on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and our family of broadcast affiliates right across Canada, the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, South America, the Pacific Rim, Asia, India, Africa, and Europe. Worldwide toll-free, my number is 1-800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www exxoneradiotv.com My first guest tonight, Exxon Nation, is Rabbi Rami Shapiro. Rami Shapiro. Uh, we're going to be talking about, well, he believes that religion and sacred texts are both man-made. Now, while there are similarities between Christian, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Hinduism, there are vast differences between them, too. Now, most share a belief in God, but there isn't agreement about what or who God is. Now, Rabbi Rami Shapiro holds a Ph.D. in religious studies and was a congregational rabbi for 20 years. He has since shifted his focus to his own spiritual practice, writing and teaching. Rabbi Rami teaches comparative religion, Bible, and contemporary American spirituality at Middle Tennessee State and is an award-winning poet and uh, essayist. His books include a series of Rabbi Rami guides, including Guides to God, Psalm 23, Forgiveness, and Parenting. His website, www.rabbirami.com. And Rabbi, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, sacred texts are man-made. Doesn't this go against what people are taught? Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's like McDonald's tells you they have a special sauce. Yeah. Every religion makes a claim that uh, their tradition or their revelation is God, you know, direct from God. Uh, you know, how do you how do you decide that? I mean, each one makes its own claim. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, I, I I believe that humans write these books. You know, you know, Rabbi, I've always asked. In fact, I was asked to leave the Anglican Church at the very young age of 11 years old because I was asking too many questions that I just could never get an answer to. Uh, for example, in, in the Bible it says, and God said, let us create man in our image. Well, if there's only one God, who are us? And our, that's plural. And then when it comes to the story of Cain and Abel, um, you know, where one killed the other and the other crossed the mountains, crossed the desert to be with his wife. Now, where the hell did they come from? You know, all these questions, and I could not get answers. And the more questions I asked, the more questions I came up with. And I read the Bible inside out, front, backwards. And it came to a point where the minister called up my mother and said, listen, keep him at home. He's the son of the devil. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, That's now when you're, <laughs> when you're 11 years old, that kind of shocks the yeah. heck out of you. And, but yeah. but, but yeah. what it did was it opened my eyes and my heart to say, all right, there's something out there, but what is it out there? And why are we being lied to? Uh, well, that's that's taking it a step further than I want to go, saying it's a lie. That, or saying we're being lied to. That makes it deliberate. That makes it someone's trying to trick us. Somebody's trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Somebody knows the real truth. Mm -hmm. Now, with the Wizard of Oz knows who he is, sure. and he uses the voice machine and hides behind that curtain, and he's lying to us. 
I, I'm not sure that's how it works. I don't think the various religions are consciously, deliberately, um, malevolently lying. To Rabbi, I, I hate to they, do this, but we've got to take a two-minute commercial break. We'll be right back. This is going to be a very interesting hour. Exo Nation Rabbi Rami Shapiro is my guest. www.rabbirami.com. We'll be right back. Don't go. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. And welcome back to the x everyone. Uh, Rabbi Rami. Shapiro is our special guest, and uh, we were talking before we went to the commercial break, Rabbi, about my personal experiences. And and you know what? I I really do believe that we are being lied to because everything is based on faith, and it seems that faith at time is being used as a control factor. If there was only one God, wouldn't there only be one religion? And so, so somebody's not telling us the truth somewhere, especially when we know what science is telling us what you know what history is telling us what astronomy is telling us it doesn't match up with what religion is telling us yeah well i agree with that i, I was I'm, I'm the only issue i'm taking mm. is the issue that they're deliberately lying i think people believe what they say i give them credit for that i can't believe it myself i think it does go in the face of science right i think it goes in the face of of the study of the world's religion mm-hmm. which is what i do for a living um but but I don't I don't think they're lying. When someone tells you that um, Jesus is the Christ, and someone tells you that Krishna is God, I don't mm-hmm. I don't think they're lying to me. I think they're mistaken, but they're not deliberately lying. But you know, when you look at these different texts, they mm-hmm. all make the same fundamental truth claim, yes. which is they're true and mm-hmm. everybody else is wrong. And you know, and the reasoning is circular. So, for example, I teach uh, comparative religion at the university, and. I, I always have students every semester who say, well, the New Testament or the, the, the Christian Bible is true, and the Quran is false. So how do you know that? Because God has a son, and uh, in the Quran it's explicitly stated that God does not have a son. And so since we know God does have a son, because it says so in the Bible, the Quran is false. But, what but that's ha- not logical. That's well, just circular reasoning. What happens, Rabbi, if the ancient Greeks were correct and there's more than one God? You know, uh, it doesn't, you don't have to go that far back to the Greeks. I mean, you can even take uh, you know modern mm-hmm. polytheistic uh, uh, religions. Yeah, right. What do you do with that? Yeah. I mean, gods die when the people stop believing in them. Isn't that so, the truth? You know, Zeus is gone. I mean, what really happens to gods? They don't actually die. They become psychological archetypes. Hmm. So in the West, anyway, you know, the Greek gods are very popular Mm -hmm. in lots of books, but they're psychology books. And, you know, the goddess within and the god within and those kinds of books, they use the Greeks. So when when people stop believing in the supernatural efficacy of a god, the god falls into the realm of psychology and eventually probably disappears. But you're right. I mean, gods, that's how it works. You know, please don't take me wrong, Exxon Nation, and uh, no disrespect meant here, Rabbi. When we look at Christianity, and I was brought up as a Christian. I went to the Anglican Church, even though they booted me out, I still went. Uh, my my children were baptized in, in the Anglican Church. My parents, God bless them, they're still alive in their late 80s. They go to church every Sunday. And when we look at the history of Christianity, where the church at the time was was in a marketing war against the pagans, and they put the birth of their Savior on the 25th of December, just a couple of days after the winter solstice, in order to 
you know, bring over some some of the uh, the pagans. Christians have adopted pagan rituals like the Christmas tree, the Yule log, and so on and so forth. Why is it that we can do that and still say to this very day that Christ was born on December the 25th when we know based on what the Bible has told us about his birth? You know, we're looking at March or April. Yeah, right. Well, I think that's because religion, for all of its truth claims, really doesn't rest on truth at all. It rests on tradition, it mm-hmm. rests on people's hunger to believe in whatever it is they're told to believe in. Is, is so, it their, is it their you know, hunger? In the, I'm sorry, yeah. Rabbi, is it, is it their hunger to believe, or is it their hunger to understand? When we talk about religion, we're talking about thousands of years ago when, you know, there was, there was no such thing as astronomy. There wasn't the Hubble telescope. There wasn't quantum physics. There wasn't the, the scientific knowledge that we have today to explain the wonders that these people were seeing. And I often wonder, Rabbi, what would happen if the same events that are held so close by so many around the world that happened thousands of years ago were to happen today, would they still hold the same significance with us knowing what we do know? Um, I, I would think absolutely not. I mean, if you meet someone who says, mm-hmm. you know, God told me to speak and I'm a prophet of the Lord, we don't go, oh my God, this is fantastic. Yeah. We don't say, oh, Isaiah and now Fred. You know, we don't do that. <laughs> we think, oh, they have a mental disorder. So religion is, right. is holding on by the skin of its teeth. But when I, when I was saying about belief and, and, uh, and, and then you brought up understanding, I think if you go back historically, a lot of the stories are ways of, you know, pre-scientific ways of trying to understand right. the world you know, we live in. Why do why does some lizards have legs and, and some snakes and snakes don't? Mm-hmm. So then you tell the story about how the snake lost its legs. If it was told in fairy tale form or folk tale form from, a, let's say, a... Um, and, and, and this is by no means meant to be disrespectful, but it wasn't in a, quote, sacred text, but told in uh, a folk tale of the Aborigines of uh, Australia or something. Mm-hmm. People would say, oh, how quaint. Yeah. But because it's in a book that we think comes from God, we think, well, that's what happened. The snake had legs, and now it doesn't. So originally, those were teleological stories, stories told to explain a, a specific observable phenomenon. But today, why do we believe I think there's there's a fear not to believe in something. There's a fear of meaninglessness. There's a fear of, you know, I, I don't know what. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, just what you said, we know so much about the world. Yeah. And yet we we follow a Bronze Age creation story. It, I, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I often look at religion as man's scapegoat. When things go right, thank God. When things go wrong, it's the devil. It seems that we need to have that buffer scapegoat that we can blame things on. And it, it boggles my mind why when people work so hard to achieve or, you know, something miraculously happens. For example, a person is involved in an accident, a team of medical professionals work on the person and save the life. It's thank God. And why not thank the doctors? Yeah, I think, I think it even goes beyond that. First, let's go back to the devil. If sure. we really blamed all evil on the devil... Mm-hmm. I might not have such a big problem with it, not that I believe in the devil, but it's better than what we really do, which is we blame it on another group of human beings mm-hmm. and align them with the devil. So, you know, the, the evil in the world, for example, in, in many Western traditions comes from Eve, you know, from the biblical story of Eve. So we blame all women. Uh, it'd be better if we had blamed the devil rather than spending the last thousands of years looking at women as the source of all of all evil in the world. And, but, and yet, how can yeah, we... we do need a stake. Uh, people do want their scapegoats, absolutely. Then how can we look at Catholicism, who believe in the Virgin Mother, or the, the, the Virgin Mary, as the Mother of Christ, and still have an evil entity if evil is based on Eve? Women. Well, that was a problem the Church, the Catholic Church had to face. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you? How does a, a human woman, tainted with original sin, give birth to the Son of God? It, it doesn't make any sense. So they, I don't know if you want to say invented. I would say invented. Uh, but their solution was the Immaculate Conception that Mary mm-hmm. uh, was conceived without sin. Therefore, she was the perfect vessel uh, to to uh, you know bring forth Jesus. Right. So, 
you know, you raise a problem, they saw it, and they came up with their solution. The problem is, for me, it's bad science, it's bad biology. Yeah. That to take, I mean, throughout the Bible, both the Hebrew Scripture and the, and the Christian Bible, there are multiple miraculous births. You know, a 90-year-old woman gives birth to, uh, you know, Abraham's wife, Sarah, mm-hmm. gives birth way beyond the, the time you can give birth. A lot of the women in the, in the Hebrew Bible are barren first, and then God opens their womb. I don't think they're talking biology. I don't know what level of science they had. It wasn't very sophisticated. They're not talking biologically. They're, they're talking mythically, meaning mm-hmm. something is about to come into the world that right. is new and fresh and radical. And we're going to, to to let you know it's coming, we're going to bring it forth from a barren woman, we're going to bring it forth from a virgin. So it's a sign that here comes something wonderful and amazing, pay attention. But when we, I don't know what our problem is, but as humans, but we dumb that very beautiful mythic sign down into absurdist biology. And now we have to believe that, that uh, you know, a woman in her 90s can give birth, and that Mary was a literal virgin, even mm-hmm. though the Bible may imply that she had, you know, uh, other children. So, you know, and Jesus has older siblings. So that, that gets very complicated when you try to make the Bible into science. That is not the point. It's terrible. It's myth. It's got wonderful teachings in it. It's got a lot of dangerous stuff in it also. But it, it isn't science. We have to take a commercial break now with the news at the bottom of the hour, Rabbi. When we come back... I'd like you to answer this question for me. So I'll, I'll give it to you now so you've got a few minutes to think about it. Is there any proof whatsoever, and I mean evidence, I mean proof, that anything in the Bible really happened? I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with our very special guest this hour, Rabbi Rami Shapiro, or Rami Shapiro, www.rabbi, ra, well, let's try this again, Rami. Dot com. That's R-A-B-B-I-R-A-M-I dot com. My name's Rob McConnell. This is The Exxon, and I will be back on the other side of the news with our good guest, the rabbi, and we'll continue this very interesting conversation here in The Exxon. Don't go away. This is The Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Oh my goodness, with Craig on the other side in master control, he's got the holy water out, he's got the crucifixes out, he's blessing me left, right, and center. Thank you. You too, Craig. No, I, I just I just have a very, very curious mind, and you know I, I like asking questions. It, I don't I don't think that by asking questions you're doing anything wrong, especially if it's true. There should be some evidence to substantiate the claims that so many people believe in, right? Well, tell me, Rabbi, is there any proof? to substantiate the claims in the Bible. For example, do we know for a fact that Moses really lived? Do we know that the, um, let me see, um, what other things can we talk about? Well, the, 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 um, that, that the birth of Christ actually did happen, that any of the miracles that are written about really did happen. How do we know it's true? Yeah, well, you know, when you're looking for truth with that kind of evidence for Mm -hmm. historical truth, you, you have to find it. Uh, corroborated in an outside text or through archaeology, some kind of evidence that's outside the Bible itself, because the Bible can say what anything, and if your only reference point is the Bible said it, therefore it must be true, mm-hmm. that's not any kind of evidence. There are things that you can document. I mean, you can document that there was a temple and it was destroyed you know, in, by the Babylonians in 586 BCE. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can do that. Can you find Moses? No. Can you find Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. Can you find Adam and Eve? No. Noah and the Ark and the Flood? No. You can say that lots of cultures have flood stories. Mm-hmm. 
but then doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that there was an actual flood. It could or at just least not be, the one of biblical proportions. It could just yeah. be a metaphor for a new beginning. It, well, you know, I think the Bible should be read as parable, right? And as metaphor, as myth, and, and, it's, and then you ask mm-hmm. the question, what does it mean? Rather than did it actually happen? It's irrelevant to me whether or not there was a Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. The story has very interesting uh, implications as a, as a parable. It's talking about, you know, just look at the two characters. Eve is sophisticated. It says before she eats the fruit, she sees that it's good for eating, and she sees that it's beautiful, and she doesn't eat it for those two reasons. She eats it. She violates the only command that they had. She risks death for wisdom. That's a sophisticated argument that it's worth taking a risk for wisdom, whether, uh, whereas Adam, her man, mm-hmm. he just eats it when he hands it to him. He's got no brain whatsoever. He's like Homer Simpson with a donut. <laughs> so, you know, it's talking about sophistication versus uh-huh. non-sophistication, women versus men. A lot of stuff you could get out of that, the mm-hmm. value of wisdom. Uh, but history is, is something else, and I don't think you find it in those earlier stories. I do think there's evidence corroborated by outside texts that there was that Jesus was a real historical character, that he did die on the cross along with tens of thousands of other Jews mm-hmm. back then uh, for for confronting. I don't, he didn't die. I don't. I I think the history, uh, the record would suggest that he didn't die because he challenges the priesthood of the Jews. I think he dies because he challenges the the empire of Rome, and and he is crucified for that. Does he rise on the third day? That's a faith statement. That's, there's no history for that. So there are some things you can say are historical, some things you have to take if you're a believer, you take on faith. But as a non-believer of, let's, let's say, the, the resurrection, I'm not a Christian, so I don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, and mm-hmm. he died for my sins and was resurrected on the third day. But I still think there's tremendous meaning in the story about, I mean, just on the, the lower level, you know, dying for what you believe in, sure. but in the resurrection itself, saying that that um, what he believed in could not be killed even by the Roman authorities. So there's so many ways to take these stories that keep them alive and meaningful in my life without having to make them literal, and then you lose me. I, mean, I, I had this discussion just not too long ago with a Catholic priest about uh, Jesus' ascension to heaven, and I said it's a bodily ascension. And they said, and he said yes. And I said, well, the body can only move at a certain speed before it just, let alone how it survives in outer space. But just based on on the speed that the body could move, Jesus hasn't walked left the galaxy yet, let alone make it to heaven. And he says, well, God can do whatever He wants. It's a miracle. Jesus can move faster, rather than say it's a metaphor for something else. And let's explore what that something else is. So, again, when you try to make this, the Bible history or you try to make the Bible science. I think you're missing the message of the Bible. And that's true of the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran and you know, all, the, all the sacred texts. Uh, Rabbi, do you think there, there will ever come a time in this planet's history, and I'm sure this will happen, if it does happen long after you and I depart and meet at that meeting place we were talking about in the commercial break, where all the religions of the world will come together as one? No. No, I, I think that... Uh, religion ultimately, despite the way it goes about it, that religion is really um, driven by the human quest for meaning, Mm -hmm. and I think that we're way too creative, innovative, inventive, imaginative to come up with one set of meanings, and that this is it. I think that what could happen is that religions will realize that they are meaning-making machines, and uh, people can just cross from one to the other looking for different truths and creating their own sense of what's, what reality is. So there's no religious war, but will we ever get down to one religion? I think that would be a disaster, because I think that would mean a loss of the human imagination. But wouldn't, it, wouldn't one religion get rid of all the animosity that is between different cultures, different social religions? Uh, uh, groups because of the religion wouldn't that get rid of well you well, know that's true if we all yeah. if we all I mean so would one politics so would one nation so mm-hmm. would you know all the divisions if we could reduce them all but I think then we'd end up with such a um, uh, you know a vanilla mind that that 
it just doesn't sound very exciting to me. The, the thing is not to make them all one. The thing to, re, to realize is that none of them are true. Republicans are, you know, just I'm, I'm in the United States. So, sure. so Democrats aren't true and Republicans aren't true and the liberals in Canada aren't true and the conservatives in Canada aren't true. Yeah. It's, it's simply other ways of making meaning. And we could, as individuals, draw from all of them to make for meaning in our own lives and to vote however we're going to vote. But if we only had one school of thought or one political party, I mean, that, that's more frightening than, than the, the diversity that we do have. I mean, the, democracy is based on the fact of splintering and keeping any one group from taking power. So I, it, I would not look forward to that. Is it possible, Rabbi, that we've just outgrown religion? We have outgrown, you know, our religions are basically, not, I shouldn't say all of them. Mm-hmm. There are exceptions. There are new religions being born all the time. But the, the root religions, you know, are, are you know, from uh, 2,000, 2,500 years ago, Buddhism, earlier than that, Hinduism. Our, our current religious, strongest religions are rooted in a time that is so alien to ours. I don't think we're going to get rid of religion. I think we have to wonder why in an age of, of space exploration. I mean, we have religions of Noah's Ark, and we live in a time of the space shuttle, mm-hmm. or, you know, used to. And, and that makes no sense to me. When, when I look at um, the, the cosmos, and I look at quantum mechanics, and I watch um, the fabric of the cosmos uh, television show about what we know to be true from a scientific perspective, and I'm not a reductionist. I think there's more to the universe than, than science can reveal. Sure. Meaning is something science can't tap. But when I look at the amazing reality of the physical world, that is far more powerful to me as a spiritual experience, as an experience of awe and wonder and mystery, than reading chapter one of Genesis. It's just, they, they couldn't imagine what we can actually see. And I don't understand why we aren't seeing a, a new kind of religion developing, a new quest for meaning that blends you know, science and art, literature, and, the, and spiritual practice into something much more fulfilling than reading ancient text and somehow pretending that their worldview is superior to ours. Wouldn't it be possible, Rabbi, for the the senior members of any clergy or any any religious sect to say, well, you know what, let's bring our church, our belief system, into the present and take this attitude where they look at the world today with what we know today and, and understand the significance and the challenges and, and the wonderment that we actually have using modern-day technology. I think that's actually happening in some areas. I mean, the Catholic Church is one of the most advanced astrophysics labs anywhere. I mean, wow. they do a lot of looking at the cosmos and, and and somehow making that work for them. You know, I think the Dalai Lama came out not not uh, so recently, but long, you know, a decade ago probably, and he said, "Look, if science can disprove a tenet of Buddhism, then we have to change the tenet of Buddhism." Yeah. Science will win. You know that's that's how it should work. I want my religion to relate to science, and if science can show me what's true, and I've been saying the opposite or something else. I'll change what I say. So I think that happens. In fact, the current issue of the um, Reform Judaism uh, Rabbi's Journal is all about science and the impact of science, and a look at uh, process theology, seeing God not as a being but as being, you know, a verb itself that God is process, the whole universe is, is process, which means it's intrinsically creative and, mm-hmm. and unpredictable. And um, so, so even there, you know, they're, they're looking to see if there's a way of changing the way we think about the stories that we're reading. You don't have to change the story. You just have to change your, the meanings that you find in the story. Right. So there's a way to be, you know, to keep, to keep the continuity with the past, mm-hmm. but not the meanings of the past. Well, let me ask ask you this, Rabbi. How would you describe God, or how would you define God? Well, first you have to say you can't define God, because God is, by definition, something we can't define. But having said that, let me define it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I define God as reality. Uh, if you, if you, you know, that's that whole process theology mm-hmm. idea. Uh, 
if I look at the Hebrew that we translate as Lord, which is a terrible translation in English Bibles, uh, the actual Hebrew is a verb. It's unpronounceable, literally. It's just four consonants. But it's the future imperfect form of the Hebrew verb to be. So even back then, somebody had an insight that God wasn't static, that God was the beingness of the universe, and it's, you know, it's future imperfect. So it's always flowing, and it's never finished. And um, that, to me, makes sense, that God is the universe, uh, and, and maybe beyond the universe, because I don't, you know, there's that limit of, mm-hmm. of human thought. So, but God is certainly everything that exists, and perhaps a greater source of that thing beyond it. But I, I, that's what I think. God is reality. So How... Good and bad, up and down, all of those things, it's all part of the divine reality. Tell me, Rabbi, when it comes to the book of Revelations, the apocalypse, how do you interpret that? Is it going to be the, the end of the world? Is Christ going to come down? Are there going to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Yeah, well, luckily I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to worry about that book. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> but what do I make of it? Yes. I think I think it was, um, well, first of all, it's an apocalyptic text mm-hmm. written at the end of the first century, when a lot of Jewish people felt, yeah, the world was coming to an end, and here was this one Jewish guy with a, a belief in Jesus who saw it in Jesus as the vehicle for this. And uh, it's it's a, a, a prophecy of what he thought was going to happen in that time, not 2,000 years later. Uh, the, the problem with apocalyptic books is that people then try to bring around, bring about the apocalypse. Uh, it, and, and the Jesus of the, Re- of the book of Revelation is frightening. And his tongue is a sword, and he's slaughtering all of these people. If I take it literally, then I have a brand new Jesus. I mean, it's the Jesus who's coming back is not the, the Jesus who's, who preached nonviolence. It's a very violent Jesus. Yeah. Just like and, in be the God between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it seems, and, and this is just my opinion, Rabbi, the God of the the uh, the Old Testament is very vengeful. He's very strict. He's very stern. You, you don't do it. It's it's his way or the highway. And if the highway isn't open, there's the Red Sea. You know, take a bang, gander of cross and bang, away you go. Whereas the God of the of the New Testament, loving, compassionate, gave his only Son. Yeah, well, you can say a couple of things. Number one, what and we you know as, as a Jew we don't talk about Old Testament. We talk about Hebrew Scripture, mm-hmm. but. I get the point. But, you know, it's written over a thousand years, and the God ideas in the Bible, I mean, the God of Genesis 1 isn't vengeful. It's yes. very abstract. It just speaks, and the world comes into existence. You, you find a very mixed picture of God in the Hebrew Scripture, because it's different books written by different people at different times, and they all disagree about what God is. So, yeah, you get very vengeful people who write about a very vengeful God. Because I don't believe in the God of the Bible— and I believe that the Bible is a human document. When I read about this vengeful God, I'm reading about a, a very angry, maybe powerless, frustrated, bitter you know, author mm-hmm. who's just going to take revenge on those he hates uh, by having his God do it for him because he can't do it himself. So I think we get more about the psychology of the author than we do about the theology of All right, God. Stand, stand by, Rabbi. You and I have to take our final break. Thank you very much for joining us. Great pleasure talking to you, sir. Exonation Rabbi Rami is our special guest. Rabbi Rami Shapiro. His website is www.rabbiramrami.com, and that's R A B B I R A M I. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One, Dimension X. Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. 
And welcome back, everyone. Uh, before I forget, we have a brand new segment starting in the X Zone on the X Zone Radio Show and the X Zone TV Show in mid March. It's called Our Planet, a Mysterious World. We're going to be looking at the mysterious world around us and the mysterious places and what they actually signify in history. The very first episode will be the Chalk Giants in England. So that's Our Planet. A Mysterious World coming to the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Rabbi, before we went to the commercial break, we were talking about the psychology of the author, the person who wrote the yeah. Bible. Right, well, around the notion of, of God being you know, vengeful or loving mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, I, and we, you know, so I, we, I talked a little bit about the, the Hebrew Scripture and different authors, different psychologies, and therefore different visions of God. In the New Testament... You also have multiple authors. Jesus is a radically different kind of character, and if you say Jesus is God, then certainly uh, God seems very different. But God the Father mm-hmm. isn't really all that different. First, there's the book of Revelation, like when, when we, we spoke about earlier, where yes. it's all about destruction and, and death. But the very theology at the heart of the Gospels is that God still needs sacrifice. You know, in the book of Leviticus, God wants rams and bulls and cattle and birds, and, and God seems to just revel in endless barbecue. And you'd think he would get over it. And, and the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, oftentimes mm-hmm. say, no, God doesn't want this. God wants, like Micah says in, in chapter 6, verse 8, God wants justice and compassion and humility, not all of this sacrificial stuff. But when you get to the New Testament, or, or, or to the Christian reading of the New Testament, it's right back to sacrifice. And God needs someone to die if God's wrath is going to be assuaged. And in this case, it's not animals. In this case, it's God's Son. But the need for a violent death, the need for sacrifice, is still there. And when do we get over that? Because that, the idea that God needs death is what fuels so much of the evil uh, in, in the world, that God somehow needs you to kill the infidel, to, to wage religious war, uh, to, to sacrifice your children the way God sacrificed his son. I mean, that mindset, I think, is not God's mindset. I think it's uniquely human. But that mindset is, a, is still very dangerous, and we haven't weeded out. We haven't evolved beyond it. We're still locked into it, and our religion still reflects it. So, yeah, you do see some changes yeah. among the different authors in the Hebrew Bible and in some of the authors of the Christian Bible, but still, at the root, it's people with this strong, violent streak who see their God somehow tied to the death of their enemies. Rabbi, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure talking to you, sir, and I look forward to the next time you join us here in the Exxon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. It was a pleasure. Exxon Nation Rabbi Rami Shapiro has been my guest this hour. His website, www.rabbirami at... Oops, no, that's his email address. Uh, the website is www.rabbirami.com. That's R-A-B-B-R-R-A-M-I dot com. And we'll be back on the other side of this commercial break at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour. As the Exxon continues, we're right here from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Thank you.